this is Tim. And this is his son, Tim. And behind the camera, well, that's me, Grant. Right now, Tim and Tim and I are on a tugboat about 20 miles from land. And lucky for us, Tim and Tim are currently pumping seawater into our boat with not one, but three trash bombs. Which means, well, you guessed it, the boat that we're on, it's about to sink. I'm in focus. Now you are. I'm getting absolutely torched by bugs right now. So in addition to big cities, nasty water, and honestly some pretty terrible surfing, the east coast of the United States is pretty well known for saltwater fishing. And while the biggest bill fishing tournament in the entire world is every year just an hour south of us, I'm talking about some different, way uglier niche kinds of fish. So we're talking about summer flounder, black sea bass, tautog. These are all kinds of tasty white fish that are also really important to the food web and our local economy here. So if pretty much everyone in the entire ecosystem wants more of these fish, what can we do to make sure that there's lots of them? Oh, look at this. Got distracted by the pelican. And by the way, my name's Grant. I work in academic marine science here in Delaware. And, um, but I mostly work on like mapping and sediment stuff and not so much fish. However, I am lucky to know a professional fish squeezer who knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. Doing. I was actually looking at poop. I, I wanted to figure out how the poop worked. Yeah. We know that um, structure-oriented fish are interested in some of the small pockets and little microhabitats that occur. Right? When you compare that to like barren seascape, there's a difference in your vertical profile. That difference in your vertical profile creates all these little microhabitats. And it may not be that each individual small pocket will effectively grow a black sea bass but it may grow some sessile invertebrate, so an invertebrate that doesn't move, um, and that may contribute to a prey base for those individual animals. And so you're creating this kind of ecological patchwork of this habitat, and so you're creating this habitat provision service, either for prey or predator species alike. We can talk about black sea bass and taw tog, because they're quantifiable and a lot of people are interested in them, but the truth is that they provide us a series of habitat functions for a broader array than just those two species alone. All right, so it turns out these fish that are really important to us love hugging structure on the seabed with some type of vertical relief. But what type of structure could possibly exist on a seabed that is flat sand for miles and miles? Alrighty, Voice Over Grant here, making what I'm sure is a long-awaited return to clear some things up. These ships were actually carefully prepared by Tim and then sunk on purpose. They're a part of our state's artificial reef program where they sink lots of different types of material like concrete, ships, subway cars, you name it, to provide plenty of structure for fish. Here I got the chance to go out with our state's reef program manager to go deploy these two ships at one of Delaware's 14 artificial reef sites, in this case, Site 11. It's not exactly rocket science. We dropped Tim's crew on the boat and they started pumping the boats full of water. They also had some wet patches that they could remove below the water line to let even more water in. We marked the location with a cinder block so that the tug that was pulling the two donor boats could sink them at the right spot. Then in about 30 seconds, it went from everyone hanging out on the boat as it was sinking to, okay, everybody needs to get the fuck off right now. didn't sink too soon after that.
nothing and then it just went. Now I know why he gets so sketched out. Okay, pardon the microphone here. It's super windy and nasty and gross out right now, but hopefully that's gonna change tomorrow because in addition to those two tugboats that we just sank, there are over a thousand, honestly probably even like 2,000 New York City subway cars, shipwrecks, military track vehicles, all at some small square nautical mile-ish area sites across Delaware. There's 14 of them and they're all artificial reef sites. Back when we sank these things, we had an idea of what they looked like because we could photograph them and we had drawings and things like that. Some of these things have obviously been sank very recently, but the oldest stuff out there was sank before I was even an idea in my parents' head. And so how do you think that list stuff looks now? Which brings me to, for the first time in about 10 years, we are going back to this beautiful Newton Boats Roots, which is not, if you know anything about Newton, you'll know that this Newton 46 was not originally meant for research. It was meant for scuba diving. Today we are visiting a few of the places on our artificial reef site to see how they're doing in real life. There's about 700 subway cars and a few over, I think, 20 shipwrecks that are down there. Our first dive is gonna be on one of the New York City subway cars, of which there are over 700. Some of these cars are looking really good, but some of them look like they're completely leveled, most likely by Hurricane Sandy. We're gonna go down for a quick visual inspection, and then we're also going to try to make a 3D reconstruction of whatever is down there, subway car or flat bottom. So let's see what happens. And this is where it went downhill. Here's the theory. We were gonna go drop a center block just north of one of these subway cars and then navigate to it via compass. Well, we didn't end up finding the car until the second dive and it was the wrong one anyway. We found the correct car on the third dive. We were able to get some pictures and video of it, although we were super limited on bottom time. Not to mention, I mean, you saw what it looked like down there. It's not exactly conditions to create beautiful photos. During our first surface interval though, we got a great mission in with our autonomous underwater vehicle or AUV. This gets a different look at our dive site by collecting some incredibly detailed sonar data. For clarity's sake, let's compare it to painting. You could think of the vessel-mounted sonar that makes the big maps for us as kind of like a paint roller. And then this AUV is almost like the edging brush. And then the diving could be like a touch-up paint pen or something like that. All in all, everybody and all the equipment got back to the boat, but it was still, for me, a really, really frustrating day. Well, those dives definitely did not go as I planned, but we learned something. For a project earlier this year, I had to do some marine debris training for the government. You know what this is? Easy, right? It's a plastic bottle. Okay, now, stay with me here. What is it now? Now, it's marine debris. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is an actual training video that I had to watch for um, some government and field work that we did earlier this year. And it, it's very memorable, but it became an instant joke in our lab. However, it's true. If you think of these subway cars and these like large ships and things, you kind of get wondering a little bit after you see them down there, how much of this stuff is still intact, great vertical relief for fish to swim around and generate potentially biomass and how much of it is just crap out there 
just like that water bottle. At our dive site, we saw from a distance one subway car that was completely intact, but then the second one that we went up to was basically just two ends of the subway car with the rest of it just being scrap metal on the bottom. But here's a map that we made of Site 13, and you can see here that a lot of these subway cars, almost all of them, are just reduced to scrap, about 25 centimeters or less than a foot of relief from the seafloor. These were most likely destroyed by Hurricane Sandy back in 2012. In fact, that large ship in the middle was in one piece before Hurricane Sandy. And that's the only event that could have caused that. So it really makes me wonder, what should we be putting out there for artificial reef structure? And more importantly, what shouldn't we be putting out there? Just at an initial glance, I know the answer is bound to be very, very complicated and dependent on a ton of things like wind and waves at each site, the type of material that's used, be it concrete or steel, like on a ship, you name it. But that question is definitely one that I would like to answer here sometime in the very near future so that we can better determine how to more responsibly put stuff out there and generate biomass without it ending up like marine debris. Anyway, if you pay taxes in Delaware, or even if you don't, um, this data is all yours. It's not up on the Denrec website yet, but it hopefully it will be by the end of 2024. When it gets posted, I will leave a link in the description here. It's free, it's taxpayer funded, and I'm also working right now on a way to put this data directly into a chart plotter, which is super cool. If you know anything about like the Garmin relief shading, hopefully it'll be something like that. Stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this one, I'd really appreciate a little like or a subscription, that'd be awesome. I have made some other stuff around here in Delaware as well. If you're from Delaware, you might be interested in how many crab pots we found in our inland bays. Hint, it was a lot. I will see you next time, maybe from the Potomac. Maybe that one's already out by the time you're seeing this. I have no idea. See you whenever I feel like it.